Ladies and gentlemen, collegiate entrepreneurs from around the globe, please put your hands together in welcoming to the main stage your executive director, James Zebrowski. Morning, CEO. How are we today? Did we have fun last night? I think we had a little bit of a holiday called Halloween. Did anybody go out? Anybody have a good time? Tampa show you a good time? Yeah. Are you excited to be here? All right, cool. So we're going to get started first thing this morning. And I'd really like to welcome you to CEO Global 2019. This weekend is packed full of networking, interactive seminars, investors, a $15,000 pitch competition, chapter awards and recognition, and of course, the most important part of our organization, our members. So I just wanna take a moment, first of all, give yourselves a round of applause. I know it takes a lot to get here. I know you all worked very hard to do this, so we thank you for your participation. I would like also for all of you to know how excited we are to have you here in Tampa, Florida. The planning for CEO Global is truly an intense process and lasts year round. Your input is unendingly important in the success of this program, so we want to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly during the event. Uh, the more you tell us, the better we can plan for years in the future. Welcome to the 36th annual CEO Global Conference. At this time, I would like to extend a very warm thank you to our judges, our speakers, and our sponsors. Many of you may not know that a lot of the speakers that attend this conference typically charge speaker stipends upwards of $90,000. And for this event, they have volunteered their time because they'd like to meet you and support you in your efforts as collegiate entrepreneurs. So please join me in a round of applause for all of the speakers at this year's conference. And of course, an event of this size would not be possible if it weren't for the very supportive donors and sponsors that participate with CEO. These are the University of Tampa, Marketplace Simulations, Hillsborough County EDI2 program, the Hughes Foundation, Clavio, the University of Florida, Texas Christian University, Enterprise, the Singleton Foundation, Tampa Hillsborough EDC, the Rice Alliance, Alma Maters, and the University of Central Florida. CEO has very strong partnerships. These partners provide resources, connections, and mentorship to our organization. The following partners are unendingly supportive of the CEO mission, and we thank you for their in-kind contributions. Our partners include the Association for Entrepreneurship, Chick-fil-A, Delta Airlines, American Airlines, Marriott, J. Thor Productions, the Acton School of Business, the City of Tampa, Embark Collective, Entrepreneurs Organization, Future Founders, Global Consortium of Entrepreneurship Centers, Law Cloud, NACI, Self-Employment in the Arts, Sigma Nu Tau, Start Engine, Startup Island, Startup Space, American Business Journals, the NO Column, United States Association for Small Business and Entrepreneurship, the Department of State for the United States of America, and the Women Business Enterprise National Council. All of our partners are equally important in supporting our mission to inform, support, and inspire college students to be more entrepreneurial. But at this time, I would like to feature one that is exceptionally dedicated to CEO. At LawCloud, we know how expensive legal costs can add up for small businesses. That's why we've partnered with the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization, bringing you our easy-to-use legal solution that helps protect business owners without breaking the bank. With LawCloud, you'll get access to dozens of high-quality legal documents, like employment agreements, independent contractor agreements, operating agreements, and more. Each document is broken down into easy to understand questions, not complicated legal jargon, and our friendly staff is just a click away if you need help. 
BlockCloud saves time and money by remembering all of your information and storing it on an encrypted cloud-based server. The next time you go to fill out a document, BlockCloud automatically populates it with your details. The more you use it, the faster and more efficient BlockCloud becomes. Once you've reviewed all of your information, you can run it by your attorney for a final review or have one of ours check it over for a low, flat fee. LawCloud can also help you form an entirely new business or raise capital for an existing one, all in a single, easy-to-use online interface. Start saving time and money on legal expenses today. Thank you very much, LawCloud. As you can see, LawCloud is a free service that grants our chapter members access to more than 20 free law legal documents. A major value for our members that are developing partnerships, filing for incorporation, or considering funding rounds. LawCloud has it all. I'm so looking forward to connecting with each and every one of you this weekend, and I've done a lot of that uh, over the last few uh, day or so, and I'm just so excited about the energy in this room and at this conference. We are here to support your efforts, and we really would love to see each and every student in this room develop a new venture. So if there's ever anything my staff or our office can do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out. When I served as a CEO president, it was an exciting time for me. There I am. Uh, <laughs> that was in 2012, and I was a chapter president at the University of Tampa. And I would often say to, in, to our members and in our marketing efforts, plugged in and engaged, this organization will help you soar. And I still believe that to be very true today. Uh, this organization is something that the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. And like I said, we're all here to support you. On Saturday morning, Giles Hertz, CEO's president, and I will provide a status update for your headquarters organization. And I look forward to an excellent dialogue before our opening keynote session. Aside from all of our sponsors, donors, partners, and of course, dynamic and amazing CEO employees, there is a team of individuals that have spent countless volunteer hours to ensure the success of this program. I'm going to ask that they all stand as I read off their names and remain standing for due applause. We have Jarlene Batista and Lindy Paccio George from Iona College. They ran the chapter development program that you all participated in yesterday. Judy Isles of Iowa State University and Kathy Elliott with High Point University. They put together the chapter and individual awards program. Matt Smiler with Texas Christian University served as our pitch competition chair. Eden Blair with Bradley University and Steve Stovall from Southeast Missouri State University planned the faculty development program. Amy Rogers with North Central College planned the self-employment in the arts track and Helen McClellan at St. Leo University greatly assisted with our fundraising efforts. Please join me in a round of applause for our chapter committee. At this time, I would like to recognize the team of event planners that put together the nitty gritty details of CEO. I have worked with this event planning agency for more than six years now, and I'll tell you, they're a real treat to work with. They share a true and deep passion regarding all that we do and ensure tremendous excellence in our CEO programs and events. Please join your hands together as we recognize DeMar's meeting and events for their countless hours of work, endless vision for a successful event, and dedication to each of our members to create a memorable experience. And a production of this size takes significant time, money, and effort. And I would like to recognize the team that makes everything you see before you possible. J. Thor Productions, a Tampa-based audiovisual production company, began working with CEO at our 2017 event, and since then has continuous, continuously upped their act. I want to thank J. Thor for their efforts in providing a high-quality production for CEO Global while keeping costs very reasonable. We greatly appreciate that. Please join me in a round of applause for Jay Thor. And at this time, I would like to introduce your MC to kick off CEO Global 2019. As a celebrated author, an engaging speaker, a committed community leader, an award-winning marketing executive with 20 years of experience at the nation's top advertising and marketing agencies, 
He currently serves as the founder and president of True Access, where he helps others bridge gaps across various divides that challenge them most. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the main stage, True Pettigrew. The only thing we know how to do Said it's the only thing we know how to do Work hard, play hard, work hard, play hard We work hard, play hard, keep partying like it's your job I'm gonna use this for, for now, okay? That work? All right, can y'all hear me? Is this thing on? How y'all doing? Huh? That work hard, play hard, I think that was appropriate. I saw a few of you out last night, so I know y'all know how to play hard. So we got, y'all can check that box. But you're here to learn how to work hard and work smart. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the CEO Global Conference and Pitch Competition for 2019. All right? All right, so before I get started, I was talking to our keynote speaker, and she asked me a question that I didn't know the answer to, and you, you all are in for a treat. So I was wondering, let's do a quick roll call. She was asking me what age range or what grade or year levels were most of the participants, and I did not know the answer to that. So quick, uh, quick house check. Any freshmen in the room? Any freshmen? Make some noise, freshmen. Come on, represent. Okay, about eight freshmen, all right, all right. Uh, any, any sophomores in the room? Second year? I can't hear you, I, can, I can't see you because of the light, so let me hear you. Okay, 12, all right, 12 of y'all. How about any juniors, any juniors? I think the, the juniors are strong, Jules, yes. Uh, any seniors? I think that answers our question. I think that answers our question. Well, welcome, welcome to you all. So today, CEO continues its mission to inform, support, and inspire college students to be entrepreneurial and seek op opportunities through enterprise creation. The CEO network boasts over 250 universities, about 16,000 members, and we have nearly 700 students from almost 100 schools represented today. That's huge. Give yourselves a round of applause for that. All right, so now I need everyone to do me a quick favor. And I mentioned this yesterday to some of you that I had the chance to speak with. And I know normally when you're at conferences and when someone is speaking and you're required to pay close attention, you're asked to turn your phones off. So I do want you to put your phones and devices on vibrate or silent, but I do not want you to put them away. We want you to keep your phones out and be very, very active on social media. Is everyone following CEO on whatever platform you use on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook? Yes, is that a yes? All right, so take pictures, take pictures of the speakers, take pictures with each other, your friends. If you hear somebody dropping jewels, Huh? Get it? Y'all see what I did there? Huh? Dropping jewels, right? Right? If you hear someone dropping something that's very insightful, feel free to share it. So please, if you're not following CEO, take out your phones, follow CEO right now, and make sure you post, 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 post. Wait a minute, real quick, real quick. All right, I'm going to y'all. Somebody just take a picture for me and post it on IG and make sure you hashtag it so I can make sure I get, you know, because I can't be out there to take a picture myself. So I need to get my IG popping too, you know what I'm saying? So I need y'all to, somebody take a picture of me real quick. Who got me? You got me? My man, all right, all right, let's go. <laughs> Don't forget to hashtag it so I can find it. All right, so make sure you do that and the hashtag is CEO Global 2019. All right, now, I want to get to our keynote speaker for the morning. And I have the honor and pleasure. I've had the chance to speak with her and you, you all really are in for a treat. So please pay, pay close attention to what she has to say. And although you are going to have your devices out, I wanna remind you to be mindful and courteous of all of the speakers so that you, although you have your devices out, let's not be disruptive and give them the, the, the respect that they, they, they deserve. So, I'm gonna to introduce to you now Ms. Jules Pieri, 
who is the co-founder and CEO of The Gromit. Jules is, uh, she is, like I said, the co-founder and CEO of The Gromit and the product, which is the product discovery platform, which has launched more than 3,000 consumer products since 2008. Many of these innovative products have become household names, including Fitbit, Food Should Taste Good, Goldie Blocks, Idea Paint, Love Pop, Outer Box, Pop Socket, Simply Safe, Soda Stream, Swell, and others. Jules completed her undergraduate degree, summa cum laude, at the University of Michigan, and people tell her she is the first designer to graduate from Harvard Business School, where she is an entrepreneur in residence emeritus. Jules is an investing partner with X Factor Ventures and serves on the board of the University of Michigan Alumni Association. Jules' first book, How We Make Stuff Now, Turn Ideas into Products that Build Successful Businesses, was published by McGraw-Hill Education in April of 2019. Now, before I bring Jules to the stage, I want to let everyone know that immediately after her session, after she speaks, she'll be available to sign her book. And each chapter leader is receiving a copy of her book included as a part of your conference registration. So you may pick up your copy at the registration desk. And if you are not a chapter leader, but you do are, but you still want a copy or you're still interested in a copy of her book, she will be distributing her book and signing copies of her book at the rear table to my right to the far corner. So she'll be here up until about 11 o'clock. So if you do want a copy of her book and if you want a signed copy of her book, make sure to meet her at her table towards the back end of the room. And so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Miss Jules Pieri. I was sitting over there and looking at this front row and thinking, this is probably a first for me to actually show up at an event where I am dramatically underdressed. You guys look really, really good. Um, I, I'm going to talk to you about um, so many different things, but we're also going to have a Q&A session. So um, if we don't get to what you really care about, we'll have some time at the end of the session. First of all, I'm going to show you that this is a place where on October 20th, 2008, my life dramatically changed. It changed because this is the first office for the Gromit uh, converted house in Lexington, Massachusetts. And on that day, I pushed a button that made our website live. And the night before I pushed that button, I looked across the table at my co-founder, who's in the forefront of this picture. Her name's Joanne Domeniconi. I looked across the table and I said a silent prayer to God. Please forgive me for what I'm about to do to this woman. Because from that day forward, we were going to be launching one product a day. And to her credit, Joanne has never missed a day in 11 years. It was going to be a wild and woolly journey. I had no idea what it would be like, but I knew that the pace would be relentless. And along the way, we met the most amazing cohort of entrepreneurs. This is a, just a segment of 100 of our 3,000 company founders that we've worked with. And this audience represents very much what this group is like because in a typical audience, one in three people have an idea for a product and service. In this audience, it's closer to 100%, if not 100%. And these folks, like you, come from all walks of life. Unlike you, they represent all ages. They represent um, all dem de demographics, locations, and only 10% of them have any prior experience in creating a product. So they're teachers, pl plumbers, dentists, doctors, all kinds of folks. And the thing that they share is actually that they've taken something from here to here. They've actually made something, which is a very exceptional and rare, rare act to do, actually. And I'm going to introduce you to several of them. This is Denise Asagai. She's in California. And she's a really avid exerciser who created the chum mat, which gives you padding in exactly the place you want it, when you're, whether you're doing yoga or another form of exercise, right at your knees. This is Christian. He lives in Edinburgh, Scotland. And he and his wife are running an educational consultancy out of their home, 
when they thought of this idea for a backyard pizza oven, the uni. This is Vanessa Ellington, former professional basketball player, lives in Toronto, inv invented a line of games that started with this one, Moby, which is essentially like Scrabble with numbers. Eugene Zablotsky, he created Bite Helper, Bite Keeper, sorry, which is a way to actually diminish the um, impacts of a bug bite with this tiny little device that um, uses heat and vibration. Andrea, she's created a um, plant-based nail polish. I happen to be wearing it, and um, I have had the same manicure on for um, over a month. It's going on six weeks which is unheard of, um, but vegan um, plant-based nail polishes actually have some superior qualities. This is um, Dr. David and Derek Meadows, and what they created was the wine wand. And what it does is when you swirl this little wand in a glass of wine, it removes the histamines and sulfites, which are the, the things that create side effects. So all of these people have taken their idea to market and they have real, realized something that the people in this room very much want to realize. And along the way, I've learned an awful lot about entrepreneurship that I hope to share with you today. And I specifically got to learn a whole lot about a broader world beyond our world um, in writing the book. It was a nice opportunity to learn the statistics. So you guys represent this. Nearly three quarters of high school students say that they'd like to start a business. Look at you, you're actually a step ahead further along down the road to actually doing that. 66% of millennials say the same. And since Kickstarter launched, they have launched over $4.3 billion worth of projects. They unlocked a segment of the economy that was heretofore basically under, underneath the radar. We didn't know about it. Indiegogo, they're um, the second in the crowdfunding industry, $1.9 billion since they launched. And this is the trend in patent applications. Now, patents are not for sissies. These are a hard thing to get. And look at those vertical lines. China's the most vertical line. And then after that is the US, the blue line. And this started before the economic recession, but that actually accelerated this activity, this very hard activity that represents entrepreneurship at the coalface. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the origins of the grommet. Um, Sometimes when you start a business, you actually, the origin of it, of it starts well before you actually do something about it. And that's true in my case. In my career, I had uh, a few different stints in large consumer products companies. And I was at PlaySchool, the toy company, when I noticed something happening. We had wonderful R&D capability. And we had these great new ideas all the time that would get sort of so far to prototype and then just sort of fall off the table and never make it to market. And I asked my boss at the time, um, she's famous now, she's Meg Whitman. She ran eBay, Hewlett Packard, she ran for governor of California, but I worked for her three times in companies before she was famous, including this one. And I said, Meg, what gives? This makes no sense. And she said, here's the deal, Jules. Little independent retailers, local regional toy stores are the people who take chances on new products. They prove them out for the big guys, but they're suffering, they're declining. And so today, if Walmart, Kmart, Target, Toys R Us, this was the late 90s, don't want it, we can't make it. And that was, um, it pissed me off, which is a great sort of catalyst for being an entrepreneur. And it was something that sat back here for me because this was a long time ago before I ever did anything about it. But ultimately, what we set out to do was to level the playing field so that you can see these upstart products, these products you'd never hear about if they didn't have a partner and somebody who could amplify them and help them find their people, which is what we've done every day for 11 years. So you heard from True some of the products that, um, that we've launched. I bet most of you in the room have a swell water bottle, if not two or three. Um, this is what Fitbit looked like in 2011. It had, you know, it wasn't on a wrist. It was completely more like a little bit of a pocket pedometer. Um, Bananagrams, 87-year-old uh, grandfather, Abe, invented this to speed up Scrabble, made it into a seven-minute game. Uh, this is what Otterbox looked like in the beginning, and a lot of our products respond to a larger trend outside of the product itself, in this case, smartphones. At the time, I, I just looked at our original video for this um, product, we were calling them PDAs. The founders kept saying PDAs in the, the video, kind of reminding how far this, this technology has come. 
This is Simply Safe. This was our first Internet of Things product. So this is a portable alarm system. Um, most break-ins happen in apartments, and most apartments don't have alarm systems. This company went public, went private again. Very, very massive company. So the claim I'm going to make to you, and this is what you will represent in your careers, is that small is the new big. And I'm going to set out to give you some of the reasons why and prove why I believe that's to be true. First of all, the bet I made in my own venture was that human creativity is endless. And here's the thing. When we started the business, the most common question I got was, will you run out of, out of ideas? No. Um, but the thing that I didn't know for sure is where the, whether the caliber of the ideas would stay where they needed to be. And I can tell you 11 years later, every single day, I see an idea that blows the top of my head off. And what I've learned is that when people go after an idea, quite often they'll give up on it because they don't see any evidence of anyone else pursuing it. And they're looking for that social proof. But quite often, a really good idea is essentially just waiting for you, just waiting for the person who has that vision. So don't be discouraged if you don't see any activity in the area where you're looking to pursue product. The second reason why I believe small is a new big is that big companies have gone into vent to defense mode, and this is your opportunity. I'm going to give you a story about these two women, Irina and Jean. They were working at a big company, Unilever, which is like Procter & Gamble, makes products for drug stores, for grocery stores. And they had the idea for a line of affordable personal care products for children. Didn't exist, brilliant idea, everybody understood it was a good opportunity. And then uh, the big company, Unilever, did what big companies do. They act very Darwinian in that they assume that if they introduce a new product, it won't necessarily take share from a competitor. They assume they're going to knock their own product off the shelf, and shelf space is limited. So they told Irene and Jean, you need to prove to us that this will be $100 million in revenue within the first year to make it worth our while. That's pretty impossible to prove. Irene and Jean took their show on the road and created Fresh Monster, an independent venture. But that's your opportunity, because a, a young company to achieve, say, $500,000 in sales in the first year would be a massive success. And it had nothing to do with the quality of the idea, why this idea is rejected. It just had to do with their hurdle, very high hurdle for success. Um, Companies are generally um, in the consumer products area spending too much money on marketing and not enough on R&D. And I'll give you a contrast. Um, at uh, Google and Facebook, which you would think of a technology company with large investments in R&D, they spend 15%-ish of their revenues in R&D. And Pepsi spends 1%. It's very hard to compete if you're not investing in new products. So what's happened is actually, um, uh, M&A, R&D has become more um, a product of M&A, so mergers and acquisitions. These large companies are buying our companies left and right. One of the companies we launched is SodaStream, and Pepsi bought it for $3.4 billion. The other reason why R&D budgets are getting pressured is retail has become a sea of discounts. It's become a very difficult place to operate. And so when you're a Pepsi, you're spending an awful lot of time just cost cutting because your retailers are asking you for discounts and pressuring you very hard for longer margins as opposed to new products. So retail becomes a sea of sameness, essentially. That's what's happened. So I'm going to presume some of you are going to pursue a product idea. And I'm going to give you five of my top lessons um, from the book, whether you ever take a copy, whether you ever read the book. I, don't, I, I feel honor bound to make sure you know these things, that um, you won't make the mistakes that I've seen many times. First of all, my first lesson is go big or go home, um, so to stream. What I mean by this is go after a very large target market, because this, there are two reasons. You have to be a genius to hit a very, very niche market accurately and perfectly right out of the gate. If you have a large target market, then you have many more opportunities to serve them, and you have more chances, honestly, to get it 
Right. And if you move into consumer products, it's especially important because retailers don't like single SKU, single product companies. It's not worth their trouble. It's not worth the legal, operational, financial integrations they need to do to onboard you. So you really need to contemplate a large line of product. You're sitting in places where you actually have a great opportunity to vet this because the way you vet, well, am I going after a large target market or not, it's largely quantitative. And many of you have, um, are at, you are all at universities, and many of you have a small business development center right at your university. These are funded by our tax dollars, the, the Small Business Administration. And they are often the people who can get you at the data you need to know to quantify a market. But Amazon's your friend. You can look at the products and the rankings and the, 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 the ratings of different products. You can look at Google and look at Google Trends. Are people searching to solve the problem you're about to, to solve? Those are very imper important trends or indicators as well. Uh, lesson number two, name your company after your vision, not your first product. So my friend Leah Busquet started um, Run My Errand because she ran out of dog food and had this you know, initial idea that her customers might have that same problem. As she released the product into the world, she realized that actually people were using the product for a much broader set of activities, basically tasks. Uh, building IKEA furniture being one of the primary ones. And so she had to very expensively rename the company TaskGrab to represent this larger vision that developed very quickly. So I find in consumer products it's so hard to bring out your first product that quite often people name their company after their first product. That's a big mistake. Name it after your vision so you have many, much more scope to go after a large number of products. Lesson number three, um, protect your intellectual property. What does that mean? It means getting trademarks on your logos, your company name. It means attempting to get utility patents and design patents on your product. And this is age-old business advice. We just heard about the legal sponsor that um, would help with this. And what's changed, though? Something really dramatic changed. Why this is more important than it was when we even started our business. Um, Jeff Bezos, who I believe might be the most brilliant business person ever born, the founder of Amazon, in 2015 got really serious about studying Alibaba, which is his Chinese competitor. And he wanted to get Chinese suppliers onto his websites across the world. And there was a rule in place that made that difficult that you, you used to, until 2015, have to have a domestic representative a company in the country where you wanted to sell on Amazon. So in France, you needed a French company. He removed that rule so you could sell directly to that country. And it was wildly successful. Chinese entrepreneurs flooded Amazon to the point that today, 40% of what's sold on Amazon comes straight from a Chinese factory with no domestic representation. But here's the problem and why it matters to you is that the ma vast majority of those products are copycats, counterfeiters, or even unsafe and illegal products that you wouldn't be allowed to sell in the US. A retailer would not allow you to sell those products here or France or Canada. And what we have observed since 2015 is that these counterfeiters who take our actual maker's photos, trademarks, and counterfeit their products cheapen them, sell them at a lower price, and win the top listing on Amazon. Our customers buy them thinking they're buying the real product. They're not because it, you know, it looks, there's no way you could tell the difference. And then it doesn't work, and they're very angry at our companies, and our companies can fail over that. So your only hope is to protect, to protect this, because Amazon ultimately can take action, um, is if you actually own the intellectual property to prove that you've been infringed. But today, because this is the, ho the horse is out of the barn, it's quite dramatic on Amazon. I, I'm actually declaring that I believe that Amazon has moved from a, into a very different, different place in our economy. They've moved um, to really the largest net destroyer of innovation in American history. Lesson number four, prototypes are true serum. It's a real amateur mistake to come up with your first idea and immediately start pursuing it. I'm an industrial designer. Industrial designers don't trust their own ideas. We don't trust our ideas until strangers love them. And that's what prototypes do for you. They give you a chance to actually hear from people who don't love you, who don't know you, whether this product really solves a problem. Sir James Dyson, who created that, that um, cylinder vacuum, you know, with the sort of clear cylinder, the cyclone, 
famously had 5,900 prototypes before he created his first product. Don't lose money at every unit, sounds really basic, but there is a kind of rule in thumb in consumer products that most people don't know about. Essentially, you want the cost of your production, including packaging, including shipping to your distribution center, to be no more than 20% of the retail price. So if you're gonna sell a product for $100, that cost to you should be $20 or less. It's a good rule of thumb to know if you have a viable business. It won't happen your first day of production. It takes a while to get there, but you have to see a path to it. And here's why, two reasons. You're gonna need about 30% of your margin to run your own business, whatever it is, keep the lights on, marketing and uh, salaries. And then you're gonna need about 50% margin for either retailers who play an important role in bringing you customers, stocking your inventory, educating people about your product, or if you go direct to consumer, which is very hot today, you're gonna spend that same 50% on what I would call dig is digital rent. You're gonna pay that money to Google or Facebook to get those customers to care. So that 50% is gonna go one way or another. So you need to know that you have the money to cover a viable business. Um, I'm gonna leave you with, I'm gonna take some questions, but I'm gonna leave you with a couple final um, sort of action items and thoughts here. I really believe that business is um, more capable than any other institution to create the world that we live in. And with consumer products, consumer activity being 68% of the economy, we have massive power. So I'm gonna ask you to do two things. Number one, think about what your values are. Do you really care about supporting products from underrepresented entrepreneurs? Call it veterans, call it students, call it people of color. Do you care about environmental concerns? Do you care about products made in the USA? Do you care about social enterprises? Each of us is different. Think about your own values and really codify those in your own head. That's number one. Number two, turn it into action. You, even as students, have disposable income. And take your disposable income, and it only requires 10% of what you spend to make a big impact and direct it very thoughtfully against your values. Consider taking some of your massive Amazon budget and directing it to retailers who protect you against fraud, directing it to local companies that cre create vibrant streetscapes. Buy directly from the manufacturers because then you get to see their own stories and support them directly on their websites. Whatever you choose, it only takes 10%. So much of life takes 100%. This one, it's easy, it's powerful. And there's an untold joy in supporting these companies who create jobs in local communities, who are the people who put their names on Little League and soccer shirts, who are the people who create innovation, who actually create opportunity for other people and for you to have access to truly different groundbreaking breaking products. 10%, it's all it take, takes. I call it citizen commerce kind of like citizen journalism, citizen science, taking action, forming the, the world we want to live in. And you, you have more power than you realize to do that. So I'm going to break, ask, uh, open up the floor to questions. There are people with mics around uh, the floor. I'm so grateful for your time. Your time is your number one asset. You might feel like at your age that um, you have endless time. I'll give you a stat that, I don't know, either inspire or terrify you. You have 4,200 on average Saturday nights in your life, lifetime, 4,200. And uh, a quarter of them get eaten, eaten up when you're like a child, like, or you don't get to, to really decide about them. So you decided today to spend this Friday here. And I really appreciate it. I appreciate that you gave me your most precious, a precious asset. So I can't really see. I'm here. OK, I'm ready for a question. So. When it comes to uh, creating a product that is uh, adding on to an existing company, say Google or a new innovation, how do we bring that idea to them um, and decide whether we should present the idea to them uh, or build our own business and risk them copying or beating out our idea? I generally think that um, an amateur Amateur move is to generally kind of hide what you're working on. The one caveat I'd say is intellectual property protection. Like I would not go out in the world with something that I hadn't protected if I had the opportunity to protect it. But generally, 
my experience has been that the net benefit of talking to potential partners, acquirers, advisors is far larger than the net risk of them stealing your idea. And that's a particularly true of talking to individuals. I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs I meet who want to, they believe their idea is so valuable that you know the gas station attendant would steal it. Anybody who knew it would steal it. And that's just not true. People don't love your ideas as much as you do. It takes so much effort to create a new product or a business that generally the benefit of giving the advice is worth a tiny risk that somebody will steal your idea. When it comes to the companies you mentioned, um, they generally, in order to even consider working with you, have to have the direct experience with you. So you have to take that risk. So I would just generally err on that side of opening up the floodgates and, and um, exposing people to your good ideas and to your, to your business. So uh, just working with all, uh, over here, sorry. Sorry, I so, can't see anyone, so I'm, if I don't look at where you're at, it's, it's not, I'm not dissing you. <laughs> so uh, just working with all those companies that started to grow over time, uh, like Fitbit, who recently just got agreed to be purchased by Google, how does that make you feel, and what do you take from that, and how do you grow? So if we're looking up to these companies, what can we learn from those experiences? Um, it makes me feel great to create jobs to see innovation, true innovation, have a home and get amplified. When we launch a product, we know within an hour, product no one's ever heard of, let's say it's coming from Australia to the US, within an hour we know what America thinks of it. Nobody else can do that. And it can be incredibly helpful to these companies. You can cut two years of sort of pain and suffering, like sort of suffering and anonymity out of their lives because we give them instant credibility, visibility, the press shows up, retailers show up. So that makes me feel great because that means jobs are happening and that means better products are getting created, products with values. Um, in terms of like lessons you can take away from them, I think maybe one thing I could tell you is um, there are varying degrees of scale that represent success. And I, I wanna give you kind of a s visual on that because that, that's hard to understand. I was. There's a case on our company at, at, that's taught at Harvard Business School, and the last time it was taught, I went, and the students were, had a very abstract understanding of the type of companies you work with. The advice they were given kind of didn't make sense for the companies. So I pulled three grommets out of my purse. I have a yellow purse over there that I carry three things that I always use. Um, one of them is, uh, it's called Pod Pockets, and it's a um, little silicone case for AirPods, because AirPods are easy to lose and it clips onto my purse or my belt loop and um, provides a great function. So number one, I was, asked, I was challenging the, comp the, the students to think about how big do you think these companies could be? So I showed them that one. Number two, I showed them this uh, eyeglass cleaner called Peeps, which has a carbon fiber pincer. It's about this big, costs $14.99, and it cleans uh, glasses beautifully. Number three, I show them wine wand, because I always care about five wine wands with me, because you never know when you're gonna need to drink wine. And um, you know, how big could this company be? And I asked them to think about it. And then I told them reality. And Pod Pockets, the little silicone case for AirPods, the, the, the sort of ceiling for that company, and these are all successful companies, will be about $5 million in revenue. Now why? Two reasons. One, it doesn't have the company doesn't have intellectual property protection. So, if you search that product on Instagram, you see a lot of knockoffs. Number two, it's a single product company, and like I told you before, retailers have a hard time getting behind just a single product company. So their challenge is intellectual property, but also just expanding their product line. But five million—that's that ain't joking. That's a good business. Um, wine wands, fifty million. Why fifty million? It has a lot of legs. This is a product that a lot of people would appreciate. A lot of people experience side effects from wines, mild to severe. So, it, and it really works. They have great intellectual property protection, but they run into the pricing problem I told you. It should be more than 50 million, given the wine industry consumption. Um, but it costs $1.60 a wand. And for the average person, it should probably be sub a dollar. You want it to be a price where nobody really thinks about using it, essentially. And so if they can get their costs in line, then I think the sky's the limit. The one that surprises everyone is this little humble $14.99 eyeglass cleaner. 
because that company will be a billion dollar company this year. Uh, Daniel Patton and cre created the company out of Columbus, Ohio. He has six employees, three products. Peeps, the one I mentioned, also a screen cleaner for smartphones, and recently a uh, touchpad cleaner for cars, for you know the the um, navigation in cars. And why is that one a billion dollars? It was 630 million last year. Um, and they're, 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 it's sort of magic in a bottle, that one. Number one, Daniel has great intellectual property protection. He actually sold two companies to Luxottica, which is the largest eyeglass cleaner in the world. And he had worked in the company, invented this technology. It was deployed in the space shuttle because cleaning lenses in space requires no liquids, no cloths, things like that. So it's great technology, owns the intellectual property. Because he's a successful entrepreneur, he actually has deep pockets. And one of the major things that hits our companies is hitting the wall for being able to, success can kill you. You get the great order and you can't fulfill it. And he can always fulfill the orders. Um, and number three, he has a killer advantage in distribution because people who sell eyeglasses or smartphones are on commission. And when he, when they go to a counter and to close out a sale, the the salesperson will clean the glasses, clean the phone, and the person automatically wants that brilliant little device they just saw. So, it's a fourteen ninety nine dollar upsell that every salesperson is happy to make, and every customer is happy to, to to buy. So it's kind of lightning in a bottle. Why that company is so big, but you'd never know it when you look. It, I showed you those three products including the Harvard Business School students, would never know, you know how the scale these companies can ra radically dif be different. I think there's a man right here. Hello, uh, oh, on to your right. Okay. Tim Seifert from Grand Valley State University, thanks for Michigan, your Michigan, right? Yes, yes. I come from Detroit. Thanks, West Side. <laughs> um, but East Side is growing. <laughs> uh, beyond Kickstarter, can you recommend a great way to simulate or prototype the sales and distribution of a product? Because Kickstarter gives you kind of a, a slanted view of, of how things might go. Um, first of all, I would, I would tend to recommend Indiegogo over Kickstarter because it does have a better specialty in products than Kickstarter. But you're correct on either platform. There is, there is a bit of a slanted view because um, the population who's supporting campaigns on the crowdfunding campaigns tend to be slightly more highly educated, higher income male baby boomers. And that's not actually the economy. Um, the consumer economy is, is the female counterpart. That's 70% of the purchases. So you don't really have the right demographic there. And so you're absolutely right that it's a great way to get a loan. I, I see it as a loan against your first production or some pre-sales done, but it's not a perfect market indicator. And um, I tend to t trust the social platforms better for that. So the um, kind of jujitsu move that our, our that my, the students I advise at Harvard do is to, to create a very um, small budget to do some test ads on Instagram or Facebook for a product that doesn't exist yet. And all they're trying to do is drive uh, potential customers to a landing page to capture their email or to capture follows on the platforms. You don't really have a prototype. You know, you don't have to really necessarily even have a prototype. You have to have something visual. And I think that's a better move if you want to move very, very nimbly and quickly. I think. I teach at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And every year, a student comes up with a great idea. And they are so afraid to tell anybody about it. Yeah. And. Uh, I tell them, gosh, you need to get some kind of protection. And uh, they say, gosh, I don't have $20,000 to get a patent or whatever it might cost. Uh, what's the cheap answer to that question? Well, there, in my book, I refer to, um, to books that actually you, you, know, you can DIY an awful lot of that. Most people don't, but if you're in that seat as a student, you're certainly better than doing nothing. And that, that's what I would do. There's um, a book by Andrea Evans that I refer to. It's also on the website for the book, so you don't even need to buy the book to get at what I'm talking to you about. I, I use, I, I publish the resources in the book on my, the book's website, How We Make Stuff Now. So that would be a route 
to get there. I'm curious about what we saw about the sponsor, whether they have any capabilities in that area as well. And certainly, if, you know, as part of CO, I'd look there first because you want sponsors don't come back unless you use them. So you use your sponsors' services. That's important. Hi. Um, my name is Betsy, and I come from Texas Christian University. And one of my questions is, in regards to social responsibility products, um, whenever it comes to the retail business for um, products that are made with organic materials or that are recyclable, um, that technology, it's really high price. So it's really hard to get out of a niche market into the mass consumer. So how do you think that people that are interested in that market and they want to launch a product um, can breach the masses without, um, you know, having that burden of yeah. being a small company and yeah. trying to struggle through. Yep. Uh, Betsy, I think you're absolutely right that um, I think if your innovation in sustainable products is limited to the supply chain, is limited to the production processes or the materials you're using, it's often not enough to cross that chasm. So I'd think really hard about the core job that product's doing and try to solve not just that side of the equation, but do a job better than a traditional product would do. So it's a two for, for the person's considering, say they're spending 50% more. If they're getting a solution they don't have in their lives right now and they're supporting a sustainable business practice, they'll go the extra 50%. But it is, it is the rare niche consumer will just take something they have right now, pay 50% more for better materials or better ethical ethics around sustainability. It's not typical. So I find the best sustainable products have that one-two punch where they're, they're upping the gain in, in function as well as kind of business practice. Hi, I'm over here to your right. <laughs> My name is Jill Dorsey from Kennesaw State University. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, what would your advice be to someone who always has just a bunch of ideas and they share those ideas with people and they go, oh, that's brilliant. And you just don't know which one to pursue. The person themselves doesn't know? Yes, yeah. the person themselves, yeah. yeah. I, it, that's a common problem, actually. People, um, I think there are two types of entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs who just like are exploding with ideas, probably never want to work for somebody else or won't do it very long, and then folks who um, just see one idea that they like the itch, they can't, they have to scratch. Like, it's the thing that gets them to do entrepreneurship. It wasn't their self-image, it was the business idea. You're talking about the first type. and. Um, one of the patterns I see is that the, the more you get into an idea, it looks really great in the beginning, and the more you learn about it, every single idea gets less and less attractive. You find the ugly, you find the stuff that doesn't work, the stuff that's hard about it. And so it becomes a pattern of sort of like enthusiastic pursuit abandonment, you know, like familiarity breeds com contempt. It's a normal human thing. There's an, I, it just happens. And I would be looking for the one that can distinguish itself on market opportunity. If you present to a venture capitalist, and I know like 10% of you in the audience or so are like sitting there shaking in your boots about to do a, a pitch later today, like think, you know, and you're thinking, trying to think like an investor would think, and the number one thing they're looking for is total available market. And so I would try to demonstrate to myself that that market was very large and ideally I have a, a, a really special route to it, some advantage to it. So I might just start qualifying the idea, they call it TAM, to, Total Available Market. Uh, you know, I might just start qualifying on TAM if you don't have any intrinsic higher, the person has no intrinsic higher attachment to the idea. Thank you, we have time for just one more question over here. Hi, uh, I'm Asif from, do I hear? from Illinois Tech, Chicago. 
And I just want to come to one of your rules where you said target like larger audiences. What I've heard that everyone says that you have to focus on a small niche so you don't fail. I mean, I agree absolutely with your concept that you have to have an idea that's scalable to a larger audience. But I just wanted to know if you have uh, like come across any company that started with a like a bigger niche and bigger target audience. And if so, then I wanted to know like how they actually approached for like uh, targeting those audiences and how they scaled it. So let me. Let me take that on in two ways. First of all, there's some judgment in my rule there. I'm making that judgment as an adult, throwing over a job, maybe with a mortgage, and um, you know a lot of alternatives in life. And I know from watching 3,000 companies, it will take as much work to build a small one as a big one. And I'm, my judgment is that the person wants this to be their core living. They don't want to continue their day job. And, um, and they don't want a lifestyle business. When I say that advice, that's who I'm talking to. Having said that, a lot of our entrepreneurs um, aren't looking for that. Some of them, I would say a quarter of them, are looking for more of the lifestyle business. And that rule goes out the window. And it can be very much easier to go after a niche when it comes to marketing. So there are reasons to do that. I'm thinking specifically of Max Fieber. He's a um, student at Babson College, and he invented a cold brew coffee um, attachment to a mason jar, like super convenient, um, humble little device. He knows that's not his lifetime employment company, but he wanted to get his training wheels on. And he had an, an idea when he was like 16. He wasn't thinking about big stuff. He was just trying to get it done in between algebra and, you know, whatever. And um, so there's nothing wrong with him having done that. The learnings he's had in that experience to get him ready for the next thing, this idea he may license or sell, he'll move on probably. He probably doesn't see it as his, I know he doesn't see it as his platform. So I'm bifurcating my advice there, being very aware that you also are students in the room might be more interested in kind of that, that starter company, that company you can do alongside your studies, or the, the learning company. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. My advice is more for companies, you know, especially if you're getting into manufacturing, you might have very high startup costs, so you need to have a large market to address. Um, scaling. The, the book, I break the book down into 16 different competencies you need to scale. So my best advice, honestly, is, is there. It's a, hard, it's a big question to ask, uh, to, to answer very quickly. But um, scaling, in my view, the hardest part is awareness. That's the one that's mostly going to trip companies up, like marketing, essentially, because it's an expensive professionals game. Um, true, it came from the advertising industry. and. It's morphed a lot where it looks easier because of the social platforms, but that's not an amateur's game to, to win there. The, the, the big companies advertise there too, and they have big budgets and sophisticated um, analytics and people. And so I find that's the one that's going to be the one that people don't take seriously enough. What will be your route to finding those customers? Do you have an advantage? Like Daniel Patton, the guy who has the, the eyeglass cleaner, cleaner, has a great advantage in that he knew that selling at point of sale in an eyeglass store would be his marketing. You're not going to see national advertising for peeps. He's only just starting that on YouTube right now. Um, so if you could think of an advantage, a way that you can get to your product to market that isn't going to cost you millions of dollars, that, that's the way you sort of trump that scale problem. I think that's it. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead right back there.